I am, uh, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, very interesting session, Power Sector Transformation, Creating a Winning Solution for Utilities and Renewables. And I am Raffaele Piria, I am an independent energy policy expert based in Berlin and I have 15 years on uh, renewable energy issues in the heating sector and in the electricity sector. And we have here a very interesting panel uh, starting from my left or your right uh, with uh, our keynote speaker, Simon Müller, who works at the Secretariat of the International Energy Agency and is responsible for the famous GIVA project, uh, the Great Integration of Variable Renewables, I think that's the meaning, and which has really, um, I would say from my personal point of view, um, it's been uh, the best uh, outcome of the change of policy of uh, the IEA, or one of the best outcomes uh, on uh, renewables, because it's really providing helpful guidance on integrating large scale of renewables, large amounts of renewables in the power grid. And he will uh, introduce the session, and uh, then, uh, there is uh, Mr. Subramanian, who is now the chairman of the Indian Wind Energy Association and uh, I think a member of the board of the Indian Renewable Energy Federation and has a long experience also in the public sector, having been uh, secretary of state, or maybe it's a rather word, but the highest uh, civil servants in the ministry, in the federal ministry for new and renewable energy. So he will bring us the prospects of the perspective of India and maybe also other countries. He speaks Bengali, Hindi, and uh, Tamil, and English, and Portuguese, so it's really a global player. And um, then to my right, I don't know which languages to speak, but at least English and Spanish, <laughs> Jose Luis Garcia. He, has, uh, he is the uh, head of the Climate and Energy Division of Greenpeace España, uh, where he has been working for over 20 years. And then uh, Rainer Hinrichs Raves, uh, with a long list of titles, uh, starting as a president of the European Renewable Energy Federation, and also as a spokes, uh, vice president. Sorry, sorry. You, he used to be president. Now he's just vice president, and uh, uh, also spokesman of uh, European and international affairs of the German Renewable Energy Federation, and also with a past. Uh, as a director general in the German Ministry for Environment in the time that the ministry was responsible for renewables. And uh, at the end of the table, from my perspective, uh, Miss Helen Ternoy uh, from Oldwich International, which is uh, uh, an international power producer based in the UK but active uh, in uh, various African countries where she has also spent some years so she can bring us also the prospect of uh, quickly developing countries like the African countries. So we can start a debate now with a keynote from Simon Müller and then uh, we will have... Uh um, yes, hello ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the, for the very kind introduction. Um, when preparing for, for the session today, uh, I looked a little bit, okay, what's the, what's the presentation that I've been giving uh, across the, the past months? Um, it was based on a publication we released in, in uh, late February uh, of this year. It's called The Power of Transformation. It looks at how to handle the challenge of integrating variable renewables into power systems and the necessary transformation of power systems that goes along with that. Now, I read the session brief and then I thought, hmm, well, actually, uh, I'll invest a little bit of time and, and try to add the perspective of, of utilities. So, um, trying to give a balanced impression, uh, what are the structural changes that are going on in the sector globally, and how are some of the more established players responding to that? So, that will be uh, the theme that, that I'll be going through. Uh, I hope I'll manage to click this forward. Yes. Um, when looking at, okay, how do, how do incumbent power generators, uh, I, th I think it's fine. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Um, so if we look at uh, the question, how do incumbent power generators, um, sorry, I think you, you're changing the, um, it's not as discreet as it looks here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, we have a, we have a layer of, of uh, uncertainty with the slides, but I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll manage. So, um, exactly. Um, 
Basically, one thing that can be found consistently in every power system where variable renewables or renewables more broadly are adapted uh, or um, uh, uh, built out in the beginning is that they're met with a certain degree of skepticism. Uh, one example, it's a little bit older than 20 years where I think the, the large German uh, utilities really regret that they put that out, but I checked it, there are actually newspaper ads in the archives of Die Zeit which state that renewable energies such as sun, hydro or wind cannot cover more than 4% of our electricity consumption even in the long run. Now everybody knows this, is, this has been uh, debunked since then. Uh, Germany is estimated to be at 28% uh, at the end of 2014. A similar example from Denmark, uh, the Danish system operator, then not called Energinet but Eltra, stated in 2003, looking back, uh, uh, we thought it was 500, now it's five times as much, and in the meantime, 10 years later, they are 10 times as much as they thought the, the usual limit was. So the first thing is, um, Wherever renewables begin to grow, they're usually met with, with a certain degree of resistance. And I think we'll find that in the conversation as well as renewables are spreading to new markets. Now at the same time, um, I think it's fair to say that renewables and also new renewables in terms of, of, of wind and solar power have gone mainstream. Uh, this is a market intelligence survey uh, done by a company uh, called Energy Intelligence. It was recommended to me by, by my colleagues in the Gas, Coal and Power Division. When I was saying, I'm, I'm going to speak on this, can you maybe give me some material? And what this shows is a ranking of um, a selection that this company does of what they call the largest hundred utilities. And then they check, well, how much of the investments are actually going into renewables? And I found this very, very interesting. In this portfolio of utilities that they chose, 80% of new investments in 2003 are going into renewables as opposed to 30% in 2012. You also find that in terms of, of some European utilities, if you take Vattenfall for example, it's clear that in the existing asset base they're heavily invested in fossil generation, but when you look at where they're going, it's actually uh, quite dependent on, on renewables. We see here uh, Portuguese utility Iberdrola uh, from Spain, but of course uh, diversified uh, internationally uh, and some Chinese uh, utilities. Um, maybe one bracket, what do I mean when I, when I say utility? Actually, the term is used more often than, than clearly defined. Uh, personally, I have the impression it comes from a time where we had vertical integration. So we had one monopoly company that was in charge for the entire value chain of producing electricity, uh, maybe even extracting the commodities needed for it and then delivering it to the final consumer. Now, since that model tends to still exist but has also been broken up in various pieces or in various ways with taking out the transmission grid for example in Europe or maybe having a, a different structure historically it's not a clear defined uh, concept so usually what people would mean is someone who has a lot of power generation and who has been there for a long time I would say that could be a definition of a utility it could also be that they actually don't own that much power generation but have an IPP but therefore own the grids and have direct access to the consumer. So it's, it's a little bit a vague terminology but just as a side note. So I think what this clearly shows is um, established companies have recognized the opportunities of renewables. That's a fact. They've, they've gone mainstream. Renewables are now part of the baseline, including wind and solar. Even if we stopped support policies for wind and solar tomorrow, I'm sure we would still see a certain share uh, in the portfolio. However, it would be much lower than, first of all, the renewables in industry would want, and second of all, what is most likely needed for timely decarbonization. However, the, the entire sector, the game of, of producing, distributing, selling electricity is changing. Um, what you see here is from the IA publication, Energy Technology Perspectives. Uh, we have centralized power generation, some renewable energy sources going through the transmission distribution grid and then going uh, to the final consumer. Uh, in this picture, transport still being somewhat isolated and no high cross-links between uh, the different streams. Now, one main source that is changing this picture is the integration of large shares of variable generation. Now, this is really the, the main focus of my, of my usual work. When we look at the challenges associated with integrating high shares of wind and solar power, um, it's very important to keep in mind that uh, it's the interaction between two components. And it's also this interaction which is driving the change in the power sector in many countries. Now, what is interacting here? On the one side, we have the properties of the variable renewables themselves. 
And on the other side, we have the flexibility of the power system or wider energy system. The way they fit together will determine how much change is needed and how easily renewables can be integrated. Now, if we look to the, to the left side, you see these six different properties. Uh, on the right side, you see four grids, generation, storage, and, and demand-side response capabilities. Some observers say power systems are so different and everything is so system-specific that we can't learn from each other. I would say that's a little bit too pessimistic. In fact, because we only have a limited number of properties on each side, we can extract some general lessons on the one hand about what it takes to integrate wind and solar, but also about what's driving the change in the global power systems. Now, if you look at the different properties, I assume most of you are very familiar with this. We have variability, so wind and sunshine change over time. We can't predict them perfectly, so they're, they're uncertain. Also, uh, these are what's called non-synchronous generation technologies. Essentially, um, an old school big thermal generator will be coupled to the grid directly. Every change in the grid is felt by the generator and this generator stabilizes the grid by itself. Wind and solar are programmed, they have a little computer inside uh, their, their generation facility and they need to be told how to behave. That can uh, cause a challenge in terms of short-term operation. But then um, the next point in terms of location, I would say the most disruptive one uh, we haven't reached yet. One is the location constraints, you can't haul the resource, but now the real point is modularity. The fact that we can build solar PV cost-effectively at very small scale. That's actually new to power generation. The reason why we have such large centralized thermal power plants is there are large economies of scale uh, that are associated with that. Um, the relative economic benefit of building PV at large scale isn't so high. That's, that's one thing that I think is important. And, and it's extremely modular. It's, it's very nice to put it on roofs, for example. Wind is also modular, but only on a community basis. And then finally, that's more something to speak about market design and so forth. They have low short-run cost. So when we start to conceptualize the change that is, that is going on with power systems, um, a lot of incumbent utilities uh, that tr would see the traditional view were integrating variable renewables into the rest. I think you can even find that in business plans of, of utilities that, that will sector out the part that speaks about variable renewables and, and the rest goes as if nothing was, was happening. And that's actually one of the mistakes that some European utilities have made. We see the remaining system is isolated and variable renewables are put on top. You can think about what integration costs that, that then uh, causes, which, which actually shows that conceptually it's a very uh, problematic view. I would say any power system is a huge complex machine with many different parts that need to fit together. And when you have a system with a high share of wind and solar, the parts that you need and, and how they fit together essentially changes. So that means still we need a power system where, where uh, we have generation, grid, storage and demand side response. However, it needs to be transformed. It needs to be transformed in a way that we can cost-effectively operate all the resources in concert. A reflection of this is a change in the slide that I showed you earlier, where we have distributed energy resources generating, at some point also absorbing uh, generation from uh, more centralized renewable energy sources and the coupling between, uh, for example, the, uh, the transport sector here. So a much more complex structure, and in this complex structure, uh, we also get different economic agents. Um, one thing that's been getting a lot of, of attention recently is the rise of what you can call prosumers, so people that uh, consume and produce electricity at the same time. Now, what has been the driver behind this? The driver behind this has been that if we look at the variable part of, of our electricity bill, that's the red dot, and the LCOE of a, of a residential PV system, in the past, it was the case that usually there was no money to be had by producing your own electricity. Now, if we go from 2010 to 2013, what we see is that the red dot starts to be above the blue bar. And that means it's cheaper to get electricity from your roof than it is to get it from the grid. There's a number of factors that will influence this, and you, we can have a huge debate on whether net metering is fair and what drives the economic value for a private consumer, whether it's a cross-subsidy or not, but this is a fact. And I would say something that shouldn't be underestimated, grid-based electricity 
either produced from renewables or produced from fossils, for a consumer are perfect substitutes. I don't really gain that much, it's still coming from the plug. I think knowing that you have your own generation facility on your roof and it's your own power that comes to you is structurally a different service for people. And I would say they have a different willingness to pay for this. And I think that's something that needs to be factored in the analysis here because we might see a much larger adoption of these technologies than you would predict if you just keep the normal model of what is a least cost power system because really people are getting something different from these technologies. Now, how has the impact been on incumbent utilities with all this structural change? Um, I will use the example of, of a utility that actually probably has its service area here as well. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I'd, I'd be surprised if not. It's RWE. What you he see here is the operating result. Uh, I got this from, from slides, public slides from RWE. The operating result of this company. Um, we start in 2012, and the important thing is Conventional power generation makes up 51% of the revenue and the more regulated uh, business of distribution and supply about 48. And we see a very rapid decline in the earnings that this company makes on the power market. It's the effect of a general sluggish economy. It's the effect of solar and wind uh, in, in Germany. So really this company is struggling. Um, I myself was surprised when I saw this slide. I mean, if you, if you imagine you're, you're, you're in charge of a company like this and, and it goes, please extrapolate this. I mean, uh, it, it goes fairly quickly. However, and this is, this is the first adap adaption strategy that I see, utilities have discovered that in the distribution and, and where they can, also in the transmission system, they still make quite good revenues. Also as suppliers of electricity to end consumers. Also E.ON has put that at the center of its midterm strategy. To say, okay, we'll focus more on the regulated business where that's a possibility. What I'm trying to say here, grids and supply of electricity to end consumers still remain an option. And that's, that's an option that's been taken. Now, if we're faced with this and at the European level there's a discussion on what to do about uh, uh, renewables policy, it's clear that, that some stakeholders uh, will, will see the urgency and therefore call... Um, to implement immediate and drastic measures to safeguard Europe's energy future. This was a, a pretty uh, um, a high profile announcement in March 2014 of, of the energy companies that you, you see below. And, and actually, um, it's surprising the, the clarity by which, uh, in, in particular in the second box, that we have a given pri priority to the utilization of existing competitive power capacity rather subsidizing new construction. So, very, very clearly, these guys are saying, we've had enough, please stop. Interestingly, this is March 2014. If we take again the example of RWE, the CEO of RWE says in an interview in April 2014, my dream, my vision is that RWE will put solar panels on your roof, a battery in your shed, and a pump in your cellar, and so forth. Now, you can have different views on this. You can say, well, yeah, it's one thing that they're saying to the European Commission when they're doing the high-level political lobbying, and it's a different thing when, they're, when their public relations people are telling them something. I would say it's slightly more complex than that. I think what we have here is really different phases that, that are almost happening at the same time of adaptation to change. We've had, we've had ignoring renewables for quite a long time. I think the Madrid group is a very clear example of just pushing back and fighting it. And here uh, we have the attempt at finding a new business model out of all this. So this is, um, I've taken from, from a very recent presentation of the chief economist of RWE that tries to highlight where they see their future. And what they want to do is to become a holistic energy manager to, to manage consumers, prosumers, and local energy communities and, and add value in this way. Uh, also uh, on the distribution grid, adding system services. So this is one example of a utility that's still heavily invested in fossils uh, that's trying to change. Now, when we broaden the perspective and go beyond just European utilities, there's something very important to keep in mind because the game really is different. RWE or all other, uh, most other European utilities are faced in a situation where the electricity demand pie is not growing. It's even shrinking in some cases. So any new generation must come at the detriment of the established players. So it's very, very clear uh, there's nothing really to win. Uh, th therefore, also the claim, stop building new generation. Now, if we look at, at this map here of the world, it's a very simplified uh, way of presenting it. And we look at the electricity demand growth. 
we do have electricity demand growth in a lot of countries of the world. And actually, therefore, um, there's different challenges and opportunities of also mainstreaming renewable energy into these systems. Uh, we call them stable power systems and dynamic power systems. And essentially, the challenge in the stable power systems is about getting sufficient flexibility from existing assets, scaling down the inflexible part while building up a transformed system. In dynamic systems, uh, I think there's great opportunity to really implement a, if you have the right tools, a transformed system from the beginning. I'd say one challenge that we have here is that we have a lot of vertically integrated companies uh, uh, in, in, these, uh, uh, in these countries. And there again, we're back to slide number one. In countries where we have low shares of, of renewables, there tends to be a certain degree of, of pushback. Now, if there's a long-term vision um, of reconciling the interests with currently large electricity producers and renewables, I would say it's, there's a common interest in long-term decarbonization. What you have here are the results from uh, one of our flagship publications, Energy Technology Perspectives, in a scenario that halves global CO2 emissions by 2050. A lot of pie charts. Um, what I want to say here is, Electricity grows in its contribution to total energy demand of, of the planet as we decarbonize. So the total amount of electricity that is produced under decarbonization grows as we, as we electrify transport and heating sectors. This is important for integration of wind and solar and I think it's an opportunity for growth in the sector as a whole. I'll conclude. First of all, it's clear utilities are already shifting towards renewables. They've become part of the baseline but there are structural challenges. One is the displacement of existing capacity in stable markets and to a certain degree also in, in dynamic markets, we could talk about that. Then distributed PV is outside of the core competences of a lot of utilities. They know centralized portfolio management, it's very difficult for them to do decentralized options and for the same reason, mixed opportunities as being an aggregator for demand side response. In the long term, I think, Established companies still have an opportunity in grid investments and operations, so moving from a generation focus to a grid's focus, because these remain very large systems. Then there is, I would say, a hope to provide consumers with integrated energy services. I'm not sure how successful they'll be in doing that, whether they would be um, in the best position to do that. And revitalizing and sustaining electricity demand growth via an ambitious decarbonization agenda could be something where there is a common ground for renewables and utilities. That's all I wanted to say as an intro to discussion. Sorry for being a bit long and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Simon, for a very good introduction. So we have here two speakers from, um, uh, from Europe, from uh, an area with uh, non-quickly non, non growing uh, electricity demand or even shrinking, and two, if I include Ms. Ternoy, who is, uh, let's say, our African speaker today, uh, from the quick, uh, quickly growing demand. Three NGOs, only one company, who, which is an independent power producer, almost a utility. I, I don't know what's uh, the... Can you hear me if I speak this way? Yes? Ah, okay. So I hope the microphone works. So we will start with uh, Mr. Subramanian. <coughs> he made a very, very valid point. What's an utility? I mean, utilities by and large have been known in at least developing countries. Those who generate, transmit, and distribute electricity. Now we are talking about utilities. In India, we have the misfortune of most of the utilities being in the public sector. They are virtually government owned. And it's only recently we changed it by debundling the activities of dis generation transmission and distribution. So by and large, when we talk about utilities, we talk about distribution companies that function as utilities. We, don't, we do not generate, I mean, recognize either generating companies or transmission companies or as utilities. The second issue is, what is the attitude of the utilities toward, towards renewable power? 
I mean, like one of the speakers was saying in the morning, uh, first they ignored us. Then they began taunting us by saying that the renewable energy producers are nothing but marginal players. Then they began getting jealous of us. And now they are trying to fight us. Mainly because from uh, being about 1% contribution to the grid, renewable power has grown up to be nearly 6-7% to the grid and about 13% of the total capacity. How are they fighting us? One, they say your power is variable, unpredictable, and we do not have trans transmission systems in place to absorb the power as and when you generate. And we do not have the demand when you generate. And uh, is there any way you can schedule the power, forecast the wind conditions, forecast the insulation parameters and schedule the power? I mean, these are all issues that are cropping up. And uh, this morning, uh, the professor from South Pacific University was talking about islands. Islands that can be planned entirely on renewable power. What are we really talking about has, is having, creating a new set of utilities. Having generation, transmission as well as distribution. This is something possible in very many island countries. And it is possible in the large countries also in a limited manner. But at the same time we have uh, certain social, political and cultural issues. In case I go to a village and promise them that I am going to give you solar power or solar and wind combined power and uh, hybrid and I will give you 24 hours of power every day 24-7. He says I am not interested in it. Why are you not interested in it? It's because if you give this power, the grid will never reach us. Because the dream of every politician is to promise grid power to the villagers and the citizens. So there is a cultural resistance also to renewable power. And the second issue is when we come to solar power, all that we do is to install a, a small home lighting system or a mini grid and tell him you have some light, you have some energy, better live with it. And uh, it's uh, much better for you to have renewable energy than this polluting power which comes from the coal thermal power plants. You see, we have a saying in India saying that you cannot go and talk to a hungry man about God. He does not believe in God because he is hungry. Similarly, the man who does not have energy is not interested whether it's renewable or non-renewable. He is interested only in the power part of it. So there is a, a societal resistance to renewable energy which we have to get over. And the utilities being very large utilities, they have uh, issues of management, administration, inefficiencies as a result of which all the costs of inefficiencies of large utilities are being passed on to the consumer. But when the same utility is being asked to purchase certain amount of renewable power which is slightly more than the cost of a very old coal thermal power plant, he says my costs will go up. I mean, instead of curtailing the inefficiencies in the system to supply the power at the same cost to the consumer, he is trying to resist the higher cost of renewable and even the induction of renewable power in the system. So how do we look at the utilities? I'll come in again when we talk about utilities and renewable power, but what he is saying, utilities by and large do not invest in renewable power. They would much rather sit back and let someone else invest in renewable power and purchase that. And the system has been nearly about 98-99% of the renewable energy power generation has been in the hands of the private sector who sell to the utilities that are mostly in the public sector. I think we'll come and address a few specific issues and as a Thank you very much, Mr. Subramanian, and uh, now Jose Luis Garcia. Um, is uh, Greenpeace, uh, as a free NGO, uh, fighting uh, against utility in the future or working with or, or organizing a fight between utilities? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, we really are looking very closely what utilities do. And in fact, uh, I want to, to comment on, on 
the last analysis we have been doing about uh, utilities and renewables that can uh, give a, an alternative view to, to the data that Simon has presented today that uh, well, the baseline is the same. Uh, but uh, what's uh, analysis? Well, for example, uh, we published analysis last year about uh, Iberdrola, the biggest uh, Spanish uh, utility that's appeared in one of the, of the um, charts as uh, a, green, a green utility. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, the, our conclusion was that Iberdrola, uh, rather than a green utility, is really an enemy of renewable energy. Uh, because we see in Spain how they are uh, leading the attack against renewable energies and the analysis showed that they do this, they do it in order to protect themselves uh, uh, from the, the renewable energy development because they are trying to protect, uh, to protect their dirty energy business, that is their main business. In fact, uh, uh, in the period 2005-2012, less than 15% of their electricity production business uh, uh, was coming from non-hydro renewables. And what they are leaders is in the gas bubble. They built uh, close to six gigawatts of gas power uh, in less than a decade, but they saw how in, uh, in the last uh, six years, their uh, generation from these plants uh, shrinks from uh, more than 4,000 hours a year in 2008 to about one and a half thousand hours in 2012. That means that they lost uh, we estimate from 4.2 to 5.5 billion euros in earnings uh, lost. Uh, we uh, published this year a European analysis about the utilities that we called locked in the past, where uh, we, we analyzed why big European utilities fear change. And uh, what we see is that uh, they are opposing renewable energies again, for their own strategic mistakes. The uh, 10 biggest uh, European utilities generate uh, about 50% of European power in the European Union, but only 4% is coming from non-hydro renewables. In fact, they built uh, 85 gigawatts of new fossil capacity in the last 10 years. And about According to experts, about 50 gigawatts of fossil capacity in this uh, blue kind of the world that, uh, that we, we were shown, uh, that it's uh, Europe, about 50 gigawatts of fossil capacity should be decommissioned uh, in order just to keep their uh, level of uh, benefits at the, at the level of 2012 of these utilities. So uh, we, we don't see that they are uh, uh, shifting, we see that they are trying to resist they are failing to adapt to the renewable energy revolution, but we are succeeding in delaying it. At least what, that's what we can see from the outcome of the uh, last uh, European decision about the targets for 2030. And our last report about the utilities uh, was published just uh, less than a couple of months ago. We call it Tied Down, and analyzed why energy giants want to keep Europe dependent on imported fossil fuels. That was in the context of the discussion about energy dependence in Europe uh, because of the crisis in the Ukraine. And we see that while Europe spends more than 400 billion euro a year to buy about 53% of the energy that is coming from abroad, one third of the revenues of the eight biggest utility sales of gas and power in Europe rely on imports from outside of the European economic area. These companies generated 116 billion euros in revenues in 2011 based on gas and coal coming from outside of the European economic area. So, uh, and as it was shown, these utilities, well, six of the big eight belong to the market group that are actively uh, resisting uh, policies that promote uh, the renewable uh, energy uh, transformation of the, of the system. So not all of them uh, are doing that, but, uh, but the biggest are clearly resistant for, for understandable reasons, but we believe are the, the wrong, uh, it's, it's their own mistake to, to, to do so. So mm, uh, I, I would like to, to have a discussion today, I think it's necessary to have a discussion about what, what should be done, because uh, uh, the, 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 the interests of the utilities are uh, identified, but uh, uh, I think a, a very uh, interesting point that uh, uh, my colleague from India raised, that uh, what, what, what is utilities? And I would add, uh, what do we want utilities to be? Uh, because what we need is clear, 
signals from the government. It is not the utility that ha has to set the energy policy. It is the government but who have to set the energy policy. So uh, they, uh, they need utilities and we need clear signals from governments towards what utilities should do. And we get, well, there are a number of, of, of uh, ideas that we can, we can say. I have no time to, to go through all of them, but, but I would point uh, as one remarkable one, uh, because many of the things that need to, to be done could be said in this table um, or in many other tables that have to do with renewable energy and energy systems transformation. But uh, regarding utilities, what is uh, a specific uh, that needs to be uh, accomplished is a, a full uh, unbundling of the, of the uh, ownership of the, of the assets of, of the system. What is not uh, um, uh, acceptable, uh, is not possible to, 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 to go forward in a way where one part of the, uh, the, the generation energy business is uh, controlling the uh, distribution of the, um, of, the, of the power. So we are, calling, uh, we are talking about two different business, that part of the business is the s in the same, same hands. That makes uh, competition impossible. Uh, if uh, Europe has chosen, and not only Europe, to go uh, to liberalization of the power generation uh, system, that uh, uh, liberalization has to be full and not partial. That means that uh, you cannot have uh, a state control and, and, and uh, 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 vertical integrated uh, generators competing. We need uh, a generation uh, system, I, I conclude, a generation system where uh, there is level playing field among all players so that uh, uh, dirty energy includes all the co uh, full costs, etc., uh, of, of the business. And in uh, separating this uh, business from the distribution, distributor that that's the real what the utility should be we need utilities to supply the, uh, the service well the, the new role of utilities are, uh, that is uh, beyond traditional distribution that includes uh, energy efficiency demand side management electrification uh, um, uh, all the all the, uh, smart metering smart uh, uh, grids uh, uh, etc self-consumption and generation and so on this will be free to, to for them to, to take up this business. But this, again, needs a clear uh, signals, clear decision-making from governments of what's the kind of system we, we want to get to. Thank you. I go next. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, listening to what's been said, I'm really rather glad I don't work in Europe because it sounds as though it's extremely challenging. I work in the easy part of the world, uh, which is Africa. Um, in Africa, 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to power, almost any power, um, which is uh, a tragedy and a challenge and, we think, an opportunity. Clearly, you're not going to add enough power from renewable sources alone to uh, give power to all those 600 million people. But the advantage and the opportunity lies, as has been said earlier, in the concept of a dynamic market developing. It's developing from such a low base that we have the opportunity to develop it in a different way. I, I would accept South Africa, which does have the classic integrated, vertically integrated utility, which showed a degree of the resistance that we've heard about to the, uh, to the renewables program. It took a very, very long time for ESCOM to buy into the idea that independent players could provide, uh, could provide renewables e electricity at affordable prices, which was always their great concern. But elsewhere in the continent, we may have small integrated utilities because the markets are small, the countries are small. But in some of the more advanced markets in sub-Saharan Africa, you do have unbundled utilities. There is no resistance at all to um, renewable power. In fact, the contrary, people see that it is a resource. They have sun. Uh, all along the Rift Valley in East Africa, you have wonderful wind. Um, my company is, is just starting construction on a 310 megawatt wind farm in Kenya, which uh, will account for, well, the, the current installed capacity in Kenya is about 1,700 megawatts. So this 300 is a big slice, and it will be a job to integrate it, and that's something we might want to talk about later, is how you integrate uh, renewable energy into these rather inefficient 
and often rather fragile grids. But the will is there. The governments are keen to have renew. I was talking to the um, director of energy from Ghana downstairs over lunch, and they are embracing it with, with open arms. There is no resistance because there is no alternative. Uh, the utilities in Africa have been so underfunded and incapable of developing their systems, they will welcome anything right now. So I speak from a very uh, specific um, point of view, um, but certainly uh, Africa is an opportunity and, and there are huge resources there, geothermal, wind, solar, uh, it's all there for the taking. Okay, so back to Europe. Uh, and indeed, I think in a way, uh, Europe at present, at the present stage of developing of energy systems is on the dark side, uh, not only because development of renewables obviously is slowing down in Europe, whereas it, whereas it is still accelerating quite a lot outside of Europe, uh, but also uh, because in Europe, and I'll come back to the, that later uh, in a minute or so, we definitely uh, have the huge task of transforming the energy system. Outside Europe, and you gave examples from Africa, we, we hear things from India, I know, s similar things from China as well. Uh, there indeed it means full throttle ahead uh, with energy, 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 and uh, uh, you can, b for a certain period of time, you can build whatever you want and you do not compete with each other, you can have it all. Uh, that also bears disadvantages because people may then think they can continue with oil and gas and thus create lock-in. But I think systematically and from, a, let me say, from the aspect of political power, uh, this is much easier to handle maybe than what we have in Europe. Uh, and indeed, uh, when I saw Simon's excellent introduction, and I always like your introductions, you know that, uh, when you showed the example of RWE. Uh, Two or three weeks ago, I had a visitor, an old friend uh, from the US. And we went to see a film at, at cinema. And then uh, suddenly there was an advertising uh, a commercial uh, in this, on the screen, wind turbines, onshore, offshore, PV panels, freestanding, rooftop, biogas digesters, etc., etc. And this friend from America said, oh, already in the, uh, in the advertisement in cinema you have renewables, what is it? Uh, do you have these strong renewables companies? And then it was an advertisement of RWE, and at the end of, yeah, and this is, by the way, for those who are, are not living in Germany, are not living in Europe, this is what they're advertising. If you see their uh, commercial ads in newspapers, in cinemas, you tend to believe they have never done anything else and they have never loved anything else but renewables. And then, of course, if you look to the facts, uh, Simon had them in, their, in his slides. Actually, uh, in Germany, they have close to zero investment in renewables outside of Germany, where they are not competing with themselves. Uh, they have some investment in renewables. Uh, actually, they have been taking, uh, taking the German government to court for the nuclear phase, which certainly costs money to them, definitely. So, uh, but what, I was, what I'm going to say is that on the one hand, the incumbent utilities uh, still uh, have a very, very small share of renewables in Germany. In other European countries, and we just heard the example uh, of Spain, where Iberdrola uh, has a relatively high share of wind in the portfolio, but now uh, they like RWE, and this is where Iberdrola and RWE are joining, uh, they have built this Magrit group, we heard this already, uh, again Simon had it in his presentation, a group, and to focus it politically, a group which was founded to put pressure on the European Commission not to continue renewable energy policies beyond 2020. That was the main focus of this group, founded by Iberdrola and RWE, uh, and of course, uh, as an thinking being, intelligent beings as we are, you sometimes step aside and say, how on earth are they doing this? Are they, are they just bad guys? Uh, some, some of them are, some of them are not. Uh, but, uh, of course, why are they doing it? They are doing it because uh, until, at least definitely beyond 2020, if growth of renewables continues as foreseen in the 2020 framework, in many countries, 
Germany is one of them, Spain is one of them, uh, some others uh, may follow. Uh, the growth of renewables puts in question the incumbent, incumbent utility uh, business models. Uh, we heard it already, PV is something outside of their, of their reach, indeed. Uh, decentralized PV is something like a disruptive technology uh, which can not easily be integrated in, in existing utility business models. Uh, some smaller ones are trying, and I think those who are trying and those who are even successfully trying may have a chance to survive uh, in the past, uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, again, uh, wind, uh, wind farms all over Europe uh, are more or less uh, decentralized uh, in decentralized ownership, again different uh, in, in, the, in the countries, but uh, it's, it's not a centralized uh, solution. So what we see is that in Europe uh, there is a, is a struggle uh, of those who own assets of the old energy system, those who had the nuclear power plants, those who had the gas and coal-fired power plants, still trying to make money uh, with the power plants as long as they are, as they are working. And the new, more and more uh, cheap uh, technologies, and it's well-known wind, onshore and solar, is on, even on the base of levelized costs, which is not the only truth, is cheaper than conventional, new build at least. So this is taking place. The utilities have problems uh, that they are losing market shares uh, against new and independent uh, companies uh, coming in. And so, and I, already, <coughs> I think I've already spoken quite a long time, so to end, uh, I think those utilities which manage to accommodate the idea of system change. And indeed, again, Simon had it in his presentation. It's not about integrating some more or less nasty renewables uh, into an old system, but it's welcoming, accommodating the idea of transforming uh, the energy system according to the needs of renewables. Uh, and basically, variable renewables, wind, solar, plus some others. Those utilities which manage uh, not only in their brains, in their mental uh, mindset, but also in their activities, which manage this transformation. Uh, they may have a chance to survive, but then they are no longer the incumbent centralized utilities. Then they are facilitators of energy services on a, let me say, more or less regional decentralized level. And maybe this is a good new definition for utilities. So a very interesting debate and actually we are w talking about utilities most of the time most of the speakers here meaning as the incumbent generators those who before the beginning of the renewables revolution owned and uh, the generation assets the other meaning which also has been uh, or another public possible meaning is uh, distribution systems and actually if you look at Wikipedia, for example, the definition of utility, and not only Wikipedia, is around the concept of a natural monopoly of a network, network infrastructure. Utilities is, need, is used also for telephony, gas, water, and uh, any grid-based industry. So, and in the renewable revolution, uh, the role of the networks, particularly of the distribution systems, but also of the transmission systems, will become even more important. Now, a short, before opening to the public, a short question if anybody wants to comment on that. Is, is it not that a part of the answer of um, creating a winning that also Simon was showing, that actually there is more and more business on a distribution system, and uh, um, which are maybe regulated but can still earn money? Anybody want to comment on that? Um, well, I would say when, when, when speaking about, uh, when, when also hearing the discussion, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that al also these large companies are not homogeneous entities. There's huge fights going on inside of Ibadrola be between the renewables guys who have vested interest there and the conventional guys. I think it's similar in Enel, for example. And Enel is an example where the game actually turned out the other way, where, where Enel Green Power now, now uh, uh, has the main CEO of the, of the holding company. Um, in this it's important to see what are the legacy assets and that those drive interests, right? And, but once these companies go beyond that, for example, GDF Suez wrote off 20 billion US dollars at the beginning of the year. Stock market value went up by 6% because basically the market said, okay, finally they got it. And now they've shed the assets and can start from a clean slate. And when you look at the opportunities that are out there, once you have this clean slate, I would say distribution grids 
could very well be one of those. But there are still a lot of people who have a lot of vested interest just because they have some capital uh, in large power plants, uh, so, so they'll, they'll, they'll oppose to that. And by the way, I wouldn't equate a renewable system to a decentralized system. Uh, I think that's, uh, they're, they're distributed technologies, but not necessarily local, but that's a different discussion. Can I come on one point, one of the things, utilities. I don't know how it works in other countries. In uh, India, most of the tariff for consumers is decided by the regulatory commissions. And the natural interest is to keep the tariff low to, in order to protect the consumers. Whenever there is a component of renewable energy in the grid, there's a slight increase in the cost. So there is a resistance both on the part of utilities as well as the regulators to accommodate renewable energy in the final supply to the consumer. Yeah, well, th th this is a, a, a new issue that is very interesting that we have analyzed uh, yeah, in, the, in the last report we have published in, in Spain about uh, economic recovery with uh, renewables. We analyzed exactly that, that point because that's the, the, the mainstream uh, communication about, uh, about uh, from utilities is about that, that, that uh, renewables are raising the cost that we all have to, to pay. And we uh, analyzed uh, carefully uh, what really is the cost of, of energy and uh, in the bills, and uh, uh, discovered that, that uh, uh, while uh, renewables have two effects. One is that they lower the cost in, a, in the whole sale market, and the other one is that we, because we mm, support them with the feeding tariffs, we, we used to uh, in Spain, uh, that, that we, that's in, increases the cost. What, what's the net effect? Well, the net effect in the last uh, uh, five-year period in Spain was that there was an increase in the cost we pay, because of renewables, if we added two uh, effects, but the increase uh, of the of the cost was not uh, by far the whole increase we found in our bills. So uh, the, while the increase in our bills was uh, of 46 uh, percent, only 14 was because of the effects of renewables. So there is much more beyond that. But they are using deliberately the uh, the share or the, the, the portion that, uh, that has to do with renewables to put it as the whole story. And that's uh, uh, hiding the, the, the risk. So uh, back to the, to the, to the initial uh, uh, discussion, there is uh, clearly a, a, a conflict of interest. And I agree that, yeah, utilities are not homogeneous. Uh, there are different interests uh, within them. but. As long as uh, the, the um, let's say the, the old stranded assets they have uh, on with the conventional generation are not uh, well, how to say written off or whatever, they will not uh, uh, their position will not be neutral about uh, not even open-minded to, to the new op options that appear and. Uh, with any uh, independent thinking, you could see that that's the best position to take benefit of the new revolution, both from the supply side and from, and from the demand side, are the utilities, because they have all, all the m many more options that others don't, don't have. But, but they, are, they, no longer, they will no longer be the only ones. That, that's the main change in the new system, that there will be players among others. And that's hard to accept when they have, you have been the, the only one or the dominant or the or a monopoly or an oligopoly. Uh, so that, that's hard to, to accept. So, well, I agree that that's, that's a, there is a, 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 in, in, the, in the points that the, to, 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 to undertake is that a, a, in, in, in the areas where, where the demand will not grow in the foreseen uh, future uh, or is stabilized more or less, there is the need to uh, write off uh, uh, conventional old capacity in order to leave a space to the uh, new capacity we need for the transformation. However, I don't see the, any, any willingness to, to do so, so far. So I mean, I, that, that's, that's a problem. So someone has to take the, the, uh, the initiative to, to set the, the rules so that it happens. Because in the, in the current context, there are no incentives or the market itself is not giving enough incentives for, for them to get rid of that the uh, uh, burden. That, that's uh, what we need to find out. Political will to, to okay, what do we do with that? And the, the easy answer could be, as usual, that, okay, we all pay <laughs> for that. But uh, that would be the, the easy way. And we, need, we, need we need to find some more uh, better solutions to, so that uh, we don't have to carry on the, 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 uh, the mistakes of others. <laughs> so, uh, 
Indeed, it's true. The hom uh, utilities are not homogeneous. No big company is homogeneous. No big party is homogeneous. Uh, no government coalition is homogeneous. So what we see uh, is indeed uh, that in these big utilities, uh, they see what is happening in the real world, and they see, depending on the indiffer uh, different countries, that more and more independent new actors enter the energy market, uh, particularly when uh, government and parliament design policies which help them uh, to enter these more or less still distorted markets. And then, of course, there are different strategies of how to deal with it. And then, of course, what we see, or what we saw maybe, uh, in different utilities all over Europe shows that uh, internally you can give different answers. And coming back to the Spanish example, uh, Iberdrola, I remember just a few years ago, uh, they were the flagship utility uh, speaking at all European wind energy conferences, showing to the world that it's economically reasonable to invest in wind. And uh, we had the Madrid group uh, just a few months ago uh, when they said definitely stop, I this is enough. They did not say, but they did mean, otherwise we have to compete with our gas power plants and uh, our other assets. So, uh, having reached a certain amount of new <coughs> renewables in the portfolio, uh, obviously on a purely, let me say, portfolio-based uh, approach of utilities, we, we have a little bit of everything, and this is then balancing financially, and as long as we can deliver services, this may work. <coughs> and uh, So my thesis, Maybe a little bit provocative, but I think it shows uh, that uh, the answer is, to, is not enough to say they are not homogeneous, but that, they, that the big utilities uh, have some problems which they cannot solve easily. And if I say they cannot solve these problems easily, uh, that means if they are not willing, uh, for instance, based on long-term political perspectives, uh, focusing on an increasing price on carbon, for instance, or whatever perspectives they may foresee, if they are not willing, as uh, GDF did it, uh, to just uh, quick get rid of the old assets more quickly uh, than they would normally do, this may uh, lose them credibility on the one hand and also a lot of money on the other hand because renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And this, and this is uh, the second, uh, point. This is why uh, the, those utilities uh, which had the biggest problems uh, concerning the potential shifts in their portfolio uh, were, in my view, the most active ones in promoting this cost discussion. Uh, those were the, uh, were, were the uh, those who on the political scene, on the propaganda scene, on the media uh, debates pointed out renewables are so expensive, system integration costs are so high, and those were the guys who held up this uh, crazy idea for every megawatt of wind you need a megawatt of uh, coal or gas uh, balancing capacity. So just uh, nourishing some myth in order to make people believe uh, too fast transition is too expensive. Uh, so I think this vested discussion uh, on costs, which hides more than it reveals, uh, I think this is another uh, way of utilities which have not decided to go renewables to slow down a development which they cannot stop, but which they can slow down. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation around about costs. Um, you know, you compare the cost of some renewable technologies and they do look expensive compared with thermal options. But nobody's properly pricing the cost of thermal power. Nobody's pricing the cost of treating asthma and other, other illnesses that are caused by pollution. It's a much broader, um, it's a much broader debate than just how much does a kilowatt hour of energy cost. I mean, we are very proud that our wind farm is unsubsidized. It has a tiny bit of um, an EU subsidy in the equity um, to make, to make the, the, the whole financial structure of the project uh, bearable. But out of a 630 million euro project, that amount is 10 million euros. So it's, it's, it's almost insignificant. And as we see the cost of solar panels particularly coming down, we're looking at more and more projects in, in sub-Saharan Africa where the sun does shine, 
but admittedly only for 12 hours of the day. So for the other 12 hours of the day, you've still got to find something else. And um, that's, that's, it varies from country to country. Some countries don't have em enormous uh, resources of, say, hydro. Um, and some countries on, on, on the coast can resort to uh, thermal power because they can easily import gas or oil or whatever it may be. And they need some for their system stability. But what we see that's so exciting in Africa is a bit what we saw in the mobile phone, m m mobile telecoms business, where the mobile telephone phone business effectively came in and overtook, leapfrogged the landlines. The landline service was so poor that now in most countries it barely exists because the mobile telephony just came in and established a whole new paradigm for telephony services. And is, we are hopeful that the same thing will happen, not just in Africa, but in other emerging economies around the world. We see what China's doing. Everybody talks about China being a big polluter, but China is building massive amounts of renewable energy. Um, so it's, 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 it's not a black and white debate. We have to find a mix that doesn't include layering uh, renewables on top of an already fossilized system, but developing a new way of, of growing these economies, wh which so badly need to grow in so many parts of the world, without making the mistakes that we all made in our past. Great. It's not black and white. And maybe some color can come from the audience with comments or questions or um, maybe Thanks. Thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting discussion. My name is uh, El Mustafa Jama. I work in uh, Independent Research Institute, MENA Renewables and Sustainability, based in Casablanca in Morocco. Um, just uh, reflecting about how my country, uh, or, let's say Morocco's and also North Africa and Middle East potential in renewable energy, I see that uh, the vertically, uh, let's say, structured utility is a barrier because they, their structure, their organization, they just want to work with large scale projects and they absolutely refuse. And you know, in, even in, in Morocco now, it's not allowed to connect your PV systems with the low voltage grids. And yes, but the still the country has ambitious large scale renewable energy projects, which in somehow incorporate also large risks because when you when you uh, uh, when you mention large scale renewable energy projects it's also uh, uh, intensive upfront investment it's a huge money it's a lot of risk and so i i wanted to ask uh, uh, simon uh, mr uh, muller um, if let's say um, trying to establish market regulation for power and also trying to cut is maybe create competition, maybe regional utilities, uh, uh, utilities within a country would help, let's say, to, um, to remove these structural and uh, organizational barriers to uh, uh, small and medium scale renewable energy projects. Thank you. Yes, I'm Craig Morris. I'm an independent writer and analyst. Um, I have a brief question for Mr. Muller and a brief question for Ms. Tarnoy. Um, Mr. Muller, you showed us uh, some RWE material where they mentioned uh, how they want to become energy managers. Um, my sort of skepticism about that is that that is something that RWE can do, but we don't need RWE to do any of that if you break it down. And so uh, are we simply looking for uh, things that utilities can do um, that, they, that we don't really need big utilities for? Uh, and Ms. Tarnoy, um, you stated in passing probably that uh, we have, I believe it was 600 uh, million Africans without uh, electricity access. Um, and then you said that you didn't, uh, that no one thinks that we can get all of that to them with re renewables. Um, to me, it seems that uh, from everything that I've read, and I'm not an, an expert on Africa by any means, 
Um, but it seems to me that grid uh, expansion is actually the key there and that renewables are the strongest there because you don't have to start where the grid ends, you can just put it anywhere with microgrids. And so what we actually need is not necessarily uh, large uh, renewables generators to, to increase the share of renewables in a particular African country, but we could actually, uh, with, with solar and wind on microgrids being cheaper than conventional power uh, at small levels, uh, we could actually go faster and cheaper with renewables uh, to provide specifically uh, grid access to people who have no electricity at the moment. That's my assumption. Thank you. I'm the lady, I get to go first. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, there is a, there's, there's room for everybody. And, and it, is a, it is true that um, small-scale renewables have a place in the, in the energy mix. There's no doubt about that. Uh, most of Africa is not connected to a grid. At the same time, Africa is in an early phase of industrialization. They need big slugs of baseload power to develop their industries, whether we like it or not. We can mitigate the effects of uh, fossil fuels, and we should do that wherever we can. Um, but, uh, and, and of course, hydro is the obvious solution in many, in many parts of Africa. There are huge hydro resources in some places, but not everywhere. Um, but again, if you talk to the gentleman from Ghana downstairs, he, he is, he's cautious. He says, we, we want renewables, that's his job. But he recognizes that for Ghana to industrialize, it needs a solid base of baseload power to enable it to do that. And so in rural areas, absolutely, even in cities, you can have distributed grids, you can have mini grids, you can have solar, all sorts of a mix. Um, but there is no substitute for solid baseload power in Kenya, what we're seeing is that the base load is hydro and the mid merit is geothermal, base load mid merit, and they are pushing thermal power further and further and further up the merit order so that it gets dispatched last. That's, that's a fantastic model, but it won't work everywhere. Um, yeah, maybe just one, one uh, very brief comment on, on, on just your, your past intervention. Uh, I mean, first of all, you, we need to define what's, what's baseload. I would say a baseload power plant is a plant that is economically designed to run around the clock, right? It's, it's most cost effective. You just want to run it all the time. Uh, this is distinct from supplying energy-related services at all times when they're needed. Now, I would say we need to maintain the supply of energy-related services as all at all times that they're needed. That's, that's energy access, essentially, right? Everything else is just a tool to get there. And I would say uh, having a power plant that is economically designed to run around the clock is one of the solutions, but in a system with a high share of variable generation, it becomes less and less of the most obvious solutions. So when we're speaking about leapfrogging, you know, it's easy to say, oh, we'll just leapfrog it in some way and then we're done. This is actually hard. It's actually about finding a way in the production industry that really seriously asks the question, can you shift your demand to when it will be supplied cost effectively by wind and solar power? And until and unless we have a good answer to that, we, we are exactly in that situation where the default case is to build a, a dispatchable power plant and that's it and everything else goes on top. And I think this really also explains a different perception in a way of the possible role of renewables. In Europe, we have had the luxury of having a capacity adequate system when we started to deploy wind and solar power. That's a luxury that uh, systems in, in India, for example, and in a whole lot of other places simply don't have. And therefore, we really need to find some solid answers of how to get a good capacity credit from wind and solar power. Um, just to give an example, uh, you can put thermal ice storage in a large air conditioner in an office building and supply most of the electricity you need during the daytime so that you have the cool service during the night. And you can do that in a whole bunch of places, but we really need to start doing that. That's the type of system transformation leapfrogging, streamlining that into the system as new demand is also created. I think that's really, that's really critical. Uh, then to the two questions. Um, vertically integrated versus liberalized. 
uh, I would say they have, um, if it was a medication, you would have different, you know, advert, like, uh, risks that are printed. So in, uh, on the vertically integrated, you would read, uh, will become hostile to innovation at some point and lead to overcapacity. Right? And, on the, and on the liberalized market, you would probably read, um, will give politicians uh, maybe a heart attack because of capacity adequacy problems and disfavors capital intensive generation. So these are the two extreme models that we have. In terms, of, in terms of the integrated model, what is good about it is the investment certainty. And that's something we need for wind and solar power because they're very capital intensive. The problem is the hostility to innovation. I, I think Japan currently is, is an excellent example for this. Um, so what to do to, to overcome that? I would say that operation and access of the transmission grid and maybe even in parts of the distribution grid are key. I, I would say that's the, that's the main point. You can still have the entire power generation business and so forth regulated, but really bundle out the TSO. If you look at European examples, it was those TSOs that became independent a long time ago, such as Red Electric at Espana, that really uh, were, were innovators. Uh, and then the, the, the question what was, you know, is it, um, in Germany you say Beschäftigungstherapie or something like that, right? I mean, are we, are we looking for something that, uh, which is like occupational therapy in English? Are we looking for something for the utilities it, that, that don't, you know, they've lost their business case and, and now we need to find something for them to do? Um, <coughs> I think the renewables community would be doing itself a service, but this is the political economy of this, in finding, in, in assisting to find incumbent uh, 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 large corporations a, a new role in a, in a transformed system. And at sometimes I think uh, renewables, the, the renewables community has a perspective which could be valuable for these companies to reorient. And I'm not saying it should be the ambition of politicians to drive that. When I write a policy recommendation at the IEA, I'm surely not going to, to write, please save the company that's been uh, around for a very long time and, and you know, possibly even a politician has been having dinner with for, for a long time, right? So I would say from the political economy perspective, it's important, but if somebody else is better at providing this, at, at fulfilling this role, personally, I'm not a shareholder of RWE, nor am I of any, any other either renewable or, or fossil company, so you know, they might as well go bankrupt. Johannes Meyer. Hello, um, Johannes Meyer from Fraunhofer ESE, and um, I want uh, to reply to you um, regarding the base load. Um, I do a lot of analysis on the German electricity market on a regular basis, and one of the main problems we have currently in the power sector is that we have uh, too much base load and try to um, implement fluctuating renewable energies at the same time because um, the concept of base load is running all the time and this does not fit with fluctuating renewable energy and um, one uh, result is that we see this effect of negative prices more and more often which means that people got paid for using electricity which is really crazy and shows that um, there's a system conflict working and um, so I don't think it would be a good idea in Africa where you, where you start basically from a green field to first implement base load to then um, uh, coming into the same troubles as we already have here in Europe. It would be a better idea to, to think ahead and say um, from the beginning we need a f um, flexible generation that, that can supplement renewable energies which would be for example gas turbines or um, gas motors or something like that because then uh, you can avoid of having the system conflict and not uh, starting base load and then running it down again after a couple of years. So. And then, or there? I think she will. <laughs> Ladies first. Uh, um, uh, my name is Claudia, I'm from Brazil, yes, I just, uh, um, I'm, I want to compliment uh, and give some information, yes, related to utilities, because uh, just to give an example from Brazil, for example, we are uh, hydro, Our, we are completely hydro power base load, and what's happened the last year, because we have uh, problems with raining, and we had to complement the, the 
the electricity with thermal power. So that means an extra cost for the co final consumer of 350 euros per megawatt hour. Yes, uh, the cost to uh, turn on the thermal power to complement the hydropower. So I am speaking about hydropower. We have a lot of wind projects in Brazil, but it's not uh, the amount of uh, wind electricity generation is not yet enough. <laughs> yes, to. Uh, but anyway, when we think about uh, utilities and the whole that the utilities can have uh, to promote renewable, we have to think about the um, energy sector as a whole. Yes, and how to integrate, because you have to dispatch the energy. Yeah, the company, they have a, a business plan. They have to sell the electricity to the final consumer, for example. If they are sell wind, for example, and sometimes, uh, and it happens no wind, they have to buy the electricity in the spot market. And if you have, yeah, uh, if you have to turn on the thermal power, for example, so then you have a extra cost. So that's maybe something that we have to think when you are uh, thinking in integrate renewable, how we can, a new ways, né? you say, you are, you are mentioning how you can solve these questions, yes, related in the energy sector as a whole. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manfred Konakiewicz. I'm with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And I used to work for the government, PMZ, uh, uh, before that. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the, uh, for the panel, particularly for your introduction. And I think we are really getting down to the real issues and down to business here. This morning, I must say, in my taste was a little bit too much faith-based. Uh, and, and more, uh, 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 more, more focusing on aspirations and hopes, uh, while we are now really, uh, I, I think we are beyond the issue of can we get to 100% renewables? I think the answer is pretty clear, yes we can. Uh, but the issue is how do we manage the transition to get there? Uh, that's a real challenge and uh, I think uh, here in Germany, we are now beginning to face that challenge uh, in all seriousness because we are getting, as, as we saw this morning, to 28% uh, percent of uh, renewable share in, uh, in electricity production. And there are days now in Germany when uh, more than 50% of the, uh, of the power is being supplied by renewables. And that really raises all the questions that we have started to discuss here. Uh, and I would, I would, uh, I would bet that uh, many other countries will come into the same situation uh, when they get to to that level. So what uh, what uh, what are the issues here? I think I think um, what what has not figured in the discussion so far, and I think we should include that, is a perspective of the consumer. Um, the uh, consumer so far has been, has figured here as the bad guy. Uh, uh, for two reasons. One, when the consumer starts to consume his own energy that he is uh, creating, uh, that he is uh, 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 getting from his uh, rooftop, uh, he's starting a whole lot of problems. Uh, I don't want to go into that, but the other issue is, uh, of course, the cost aspect. And I wonder if we are not treating the cost of transition, the cost of system integration, too lightly. Um, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that there is a serious cost issue, that we uh, better face it, that we are better uh, 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 honest about that, or else uh, we uh, sort of will lose the consumer as, uh, as a supporter of, uh, of this whole transition process. I think in Germany, uh, politicians have been getting nervous because of the cost uh, developments, and have made major, major uh, efforts to, to contain the costs. Uh, and so I, th I think it is quite wise to, to face that issue. Uh, we are talking about stranded assets here. Uh, I think in, in Germany we are now witnessing assets being stranded in a large scale. Uh, 
because uh, there have been unwise uh, uh, investment decisions in the past. But this is not just for the balance sheet of, uh, of, of uh, big utilities, which nobody likes. In the end, of course, the consumers or taxpayers or whoever will pay for those stranded assets. So economically, it's not sort of, uh, it's, it's not a victory for uh, renewables if they are stranded assets. Yes, in a way they are. Uh, but in another way, uh, it's also, of course, an unwise, a result of unwise policy decisions or investment decisions. And I think, uh, I think the challenge is, uh, how do we find a better way of managing the transition? Yeah, well, I can try uh, to answer part of that and uh, another co comment. Indeed, uh, directly to what Manfred Konekiewicz was saying, we, indeed, all these problems, they are not invented. They are real problems. They are real problems uh, for the society. They are real problems for the consumers, indeed, because they see their uh, uh, sheets going up, their, uh, their costs going up. But, of course, uh, part, of the part of truth uh, must always also be to see how are these costs really com uh, composed, uh, what do they consist of, and then you know from your work in the government that, including the government, there ha have always been attempts to explain that the development of renewables, the adaptation costs of renewables, if they are to attribute, uh, be attributed to renewables at all, that they have always only been a minor part uh, of, the, of the real cost uh, problem. Uh, the, there have been other elements uh, like the pricing in of uh, CO2 certificates which had been granted for free. Uh, then there had been cost increases uh, by uh, electricity companies in the past years which have not been taken back although the raw material became cheaper. So it's, it's a complex issue. But I agree we, have, we need truth and transparency because otherwise we lose the politicians. If we lose the politicians uh, they may uh, no longer dare to decide to go on uh, at the necessary uh, pace uh, with the energy transition. But uh, another point, and this is my final remark for now, uh, I think we have to be very, very careful uh, when using, defining, redefining uh, this issue of base load. So, so many people have, have tried, you have tried, you have tried, and I will try, <laughs> I will try now. I think, indeed, uh, what is important uh, is to accept uh, indeed, that we need uh, what the people want is energy services. They, they want energy uh, f whenever they need it, uh, and transforming, thi uh, translating this into the old base mid peak load uh, concept may already be a problem in, in Europe and elsewhere. We we have to transform the system from this uh, to the new flexible system. But I can only say, uh, as being an outsider for, for Africa or otherwise, why should you repeat? our mistakes, our mistakes uh, of building this system. Uh, there are ways, and at least the questions were raised here so far, how can we deliver 24-7 energy services basically on variable renewables with some uh, demand management, uh, with some uh, peak load, but peak load has always been needed, not only due to renewables. Every football match, half-time break, people go to the loo, go to the refrigerator, so you have electricity peaks. So this is everyday business of utilities to, to buy, to add and uh, cut uh, electricity. So why not try to be really innovative in order, uh, instead of repeating the mistakes and the costs later on, uh, which we have done here in Europe? I feel put upon. Um, you're absolutely right, and and I, I I tried to make that point with the with the analogy of the mobile phones. Uh, we certainly should not repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, at the same time, what we are seeing in um, in the emerging economies, Africa is one, is there is a huge need to just add power, and what we need to to get our heads around is how to do that in the most sustainable way. And my market is open to that. People are not hidebound. They don't look at the model in Europe or North America and say, yes, that's what we should do. Far from it. Um, th there's a great pride in Africa of finding African solutions to African problems. And this extends to the power industry. So uh, where, where, as I said earlier, where people have where countries have baseload power in the form of hydro, 
That is a marvelous resource and it should be exploited. But as you've said very rightly in Brazil, you've seen when the rain doesn't rain, then you, you, you've got to put something else in. And where we're adding capacity into very fragile systems in very poor countries, in the most case in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it, the, there is a danger that you, you have to duplicate. Because the sun only shines for 12 hours of the day, you're having to invest in assets that will generate for the other 12 hours of the day. So you're investing twice. And that is a problem we're still trying to get our heads around, and I don't think any of us have solved it yet. But wind blows at night. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, I would like to add, uh, I may also uh, make a comment or ask a question, because I think we have, um, uh, so first we have the good news that uh, the, the one speaker who has to catch a train, uh, maybe the others can stay 10 minutes longer because the train is delayed maybe. <laughs> And uh, so um, if anybody is interested because it looks uh, interesting, maybe we can prolong the session. Um, so we, we are talking about utilities as incumbent generators most of the time. As, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I would like to... Uh, um, well, then there is a second dimension we have not talked about yet, really, but uh, sometimes it's uh, in the media or it's in the discussion, which is the provider, the, the large company providing uh, the equity for large investments. Of course, there is the argument uh, also pension funds can buy offshore wind park and can build offshore wind parks. But uh, I just wanted to raise this point. Maybe somebody wants to comment on that because we are going into a capital more capital intensive system. So we need a lot of investments. And there is some people believe or maybe still believe that only utilities can uh, can manage that. And then there is a third point, and I would like to maybe make the thesis even stronger. The, the, the future system with large shares of renewables is a system where the elements of natural monopoly become s even uh, become stronger maybe than uh, in the system with large uh, amounts of fossil fuels. In the because in a system with large amounts of fossil fuels, uh, most of a lot of money is spent to buy coal and gas and oil and. Uh, and uh, not much money is spent to, uh, for radioactive waste uh, disposal because that's for free, uh, apparently. <laughs> but um, uh, um, uh, but uh, in the future system, we have m it's more grid intensive, it's more coordination intensive. And by the way, also if you look at the interaction with the heating system in the countries, so that maybe it's not for Africa, but in Europe, we need a lot of heating. So we probably need more district heating infrastructure, so also capital intensive, also natural monopoly. So in all these contexts, the, the word utility, which is also meant as uh, the company that manages or, uh, or operates a natural monopoly, of course, is uh, maybe the ro that role will become more important. I don't know whether it will be the RWE or somebody else, but the distribution systems and the transmission systems, there is more capital in the distribution systems than in the transmission system, so that's why I think they are also very important. Th this is an important role, and so we have three roles, uh, uh, the, mon the natural monopoly, the capital provider or the large company, and the incumbent generator. This was just... Uh, an offer for the last round of comments and uh, of questions. Um, I think someone wanted to say something. Or no. One or two points uh, they arising from the point made by the. We are trying to get the distribution utilities to comply with renewable portfolio obligations. This is an important issue, but most utilities look at them as. Liabilities are a thing that is not required to be done, but they are being forced by the laws to come. In fact, that's the position in the US uh, where recently they got the financial investors to they got the financial investors to talk about uh, the share prices of electricity utilities going down because they are being forced to purchase costly renewable power by having a statutory obligation to do. The second, there are issues, it's not the cost of renewable systems alone. I mean, there are other issues in various countries which prevent the deployment of renewables. For example, uh, if I want to set up a renewable solar system by having the lease rights of hundreds so rooftops of houses. I mean, I start a company, I agree to power, generate solar power and supply it to the, the residential owners but they don't have the capital to invest in it. But can I, as a company, 
lease the rooftop rights and sell the power to them. And in case I happen to be generating more than what the residences require, can I supply it to the utility at a fixed agreed cost? It need not necessarily be higher than the consumer tariff, but let it be at the same consumer tariff. But this is where we have the resistance from the utilities because uh, they do not want to give up selling the cheap coal-based thermal power that they set up years ago. I mean, these are all issues we have to grapple with. The magnitude of these problems could be different in different countries. But we should also simultaneously look at just not the utilities and electricity regulatory systems, but your fiscal policy, the monetary policy, how do they allow the legal rights of leasing spaces or owning spaces. These become also important. Um, yeah, maybe a, a few comments to some of the, the, the points that were raised. Uh, to, to pick up on the, on the question, uh, if we look at dynamically expanding power systems, uh, can they avoid building new coal plants? I think that's the, that's, that's the critical issue here. Um, I think there's a very natural move in, in uh, European context to say, oh, just build gas plants because they have lower capex, higher opex ratios, and they fit better. Uh, two comments on that. One is not everybody has access to gas. Uh, Europe might find itself in a similar situation. And uh, the, second, the second is that uh, usually these models do not take into account the impact on the gas grid itself and the sunk capital in the gas grid. So we might overestimate the technical flexibility uh, of gas plants or the economic flexibility of gas plants because we're not modeling the hit in asset utilization that the grid will take, the gas grid will take. So I'd be, um, yeah, it's maybe a point for discussion. When we, look at, when we look at the situation in emerging economies, one thing that, that I think is a relevant issue in India is fuel procurement risk, right? Can we actually get the coal to, to, to have it there? There's even been enterprises with, with uh, a joint venture in a mine in Indonesia that then was expropriated and then power generators couldn't generate. Now, if I don't price that in, coal looks very cheap. But if I do price that in, it becomes more expensive and saving coal via wind and solar becomes much more interesting. Because basically what it takes to store coal is you put it on a pile. If you're constrained in coal supply, you'll be happy for every kilowatt hour of energy that you can get from other sources, and that changes the picture. But however, the, the discos in this case would have to show some kind of fuel procurement risk because the energy supply situation is so bad that customers just get cut off. So I think there are intermediate solutions that could alleviate some of, some of these issues. Um, then maybe one quick comment on Brazil. I think saying Brazil, the problem there is hydropower is a little bit short. I mean, one thing is the government, I think it's more the dynamics of a planned system. So the Brazilian system has a centralized planner, EPE, which is subject also to a lot of political intervention. And I think Dilma Rousseff basically expropriated Electrobras partially. Uh, w with the renewable of concessions, there was a double digit reduction in electricity prices and this came at the same moment when there was a drought. Uh, and there was a bad design of the backup capacity mechanism. So there's, there's a lot of discussion to be had. I think it's, it's more complex than just saying uh, uh, hydropower was a problem there and, and backup is expensive. There, yes. Yeah. In, Yes, sure. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity. Belo Monte will be a run of river power plant, and there's a perfect seasonal correlation with wind. And that should be, that should be uh, really reaped. There's, uh, I, I think that's a, a, where, yeah, where it fits very well. Then if we look at the cost to consumers, well, first of all, which consumers? Uh, I think the only stakeholders in Germany and Europe that have really won from all of this are the people who are directly buying in the wholesale market wholesale electricity market. It's I mean, a company like BASF, for example, right? They, they are not paying uh, significantly for carbon emissions and they're benefiting from very, very low electricity prices. They are the ones that have the most to lose currently. If you look at the total cost of the electricity system for running it between 2008 and 2013 in Germany, it's not that different. I mean, there's not a huge difference, but the redistribution is huge. So we have a huge distribution going on from the, from the owners of fossil power plants to on the one hand, people buying directly from the spot market and going to renewable energy producers because of the merit order effect. And we have a redistribution going on from domestic consumers going to renewable producers and going to uh, liberalized consumers. So the political 
uh, dynamite in this, I would say, is really the redistribution issue behind it and handling it. I think one point to keep in mind here is decarbonization is more than the electricity system. And I would say also to solve some issues in, in, with net metering, we need to move the EEG surcharge or, or the renewable surcharges out of the electricity system and into the wider energy system, also because we need to decarbonize the wider energy system. And that could be a route to, to alleviate some of the problems. Um, and then maybe a final comment on, on the question of capital stock. Uh, will it be like a big monopoly who will provide the capital? I would say um, the risk return profile of an investment determines the kind of investor that can invest in it. And exactly the risk return profile of a, of a private utility is one that leans towards higher risk, higher return. That's exactly the reason why a lot of them couldn't benefit from feed-in tariffs, because it was low risk, low return. It didn't match the capital stock. And in that sense, if we look what capital stocks are out there and which ones fit renewables, we need to look for the low risk, low return capital stocks. Why? The cost of financing is a huge issue for renewables. At 9% uh, weighted average cost of capital, you have 50% of a PV project just going into the cost of financing. So we need to find capital pools that have low cost of capital. And I think that would lead to more institutional investors. Um, I would say if you're faced, if you're in a, in, if you're in a government in, in India, for example, it's very hard, you need all options available. But the thing is, we need to implement structural change to say you need to plan your factory in a way that takes into account that power will be very, very cheap during certain periods of time. It's about mandating or making sure that new air conditioners actually have thermal storage. So it's, it's really a transition issue. I don't think we have the solutions yet that are ready-made to just take them off the shelf and there you go, you have your decarbonized system based solely on renewables, which is cost competitive. I, I think we're simply uh, not there yet. But at the same time, breaking the mindset and saying it's not about having a power plant that runs around the clock all the time, but what it's about is providing the energy-related service, taking into account that on a summer weekend, you'll have power for free. That's the, I think that's really the, the essence of the challenge. Well, great. Now we are already a couple of minutes uh, uh, beyond schedule. Uh, so uh, if there are no other uh, big questions, I would uh, give also the other speakers the opportunity to uh, give a last comment, starting with uh, Jose Luis Garcia. Yeah, but because uh, lastly there have been new issues emerged that I think are, are very uh, interesting. That, uh, for example, uh, what you mentioned about the, about the, the that uh, uh, they need to to uh, share the the, the cost uh, of the of the transition uh, or the support for renewable energy towards beyond the, the electricity system is a, a very important uh, uh, point. And in fact, uh, I, beyond my role in Greenpeace, I am I'm also a founding member of the Renewables Foundation. And the, and the first uh, in Spain, and the first proposal we put on the table was just that. That uh, we, we need uh, to to uh, expand the support system to the whole uh, energy system. We didn't succeed, and that, uh, it's important to realize that uh, because today we have been talking about the role, the role of utilities and the resistance they, they put against the, the 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 energy transformation of the system. It's not only the utilities, also the the, the oil lobby and the gas lobby resists a lot a lot to having to bear their own uh, share in the in the transformation. But it it would be make a lot of sense. In, in order to ease the, the transition uh, for very, very logical reason that we are looking at the was uh, raised uh, also before that we have to look at the whole energy system not just the electricity system in fact uh, one of the analysis that we did in Spain that we call energy 3.0 uh, uh, looks at the, at the uh, how would the whole energy system uh, how would it look like and, and we uh, uh, saw that that uh, the, it would be much much cheaper and much technically easier to, uh, uh, to, to create a, a whole 100% renewable energy system based on efficiency and, and uh, uh, a smart uh, uh, system and so on uh, if we uh, integrate the whole energy system and not uh, uh, keep the way we are now with separate uh, uh, gas system, oil system, uh, transportation, uh, electricity separated. So it's, it's uh, something that uh, if we make it all together, uh, we will uh, bring the, the best solution. That doesn't mean that we have uh, one single solution for, for every country. Uh, uh, then we have to come down to every system to, to find out which are the best uh, solutions. Yeah. 
just a, a very, very brief answer to <laughs> the question of, the, of that panel, because I uh, said other things already. So the qu in, indeed, the future energy system will, whether it will be completely decentralized or not, this is not the question, but re a renewables-based system will have much more decentralized elements, a much broader mix, much more uh, relying on the distribution system. And then there will certainly be some need for providing services for customers, for checking things out, for, for planning, uh, for uh, uh, providing all these services. And then I come, come to Craig's question, whether or not the existing utilities have a role to play in this or not, we'll see whether these not homogeneous utilities have enough smart brains to really play actively, smartly uh, in this market. Uh, maybe then they have a role to play. If they fail to uh, do this, they will fail uh, their business. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, I wanted to pick up on what Simon said about low risk, low return. Um, where I think the whole world has it in common is that um, if we are to have institutional investors uh, investing in these assets, which are so vital, we need to have political and regulatory certainty. And that applies just as much in Europe as it does in Africa. Without that, you won't get low-cost investment, and it will continue to be a, a highly risky, highly expensive enterprise. Just a small point, I mean, if you want the utilities to really come in, let's also think about uh, commercial innovations and financial innovations that could scale up renewables to make them attractive for the utilities. I mean, it's possible. It's not time to sell its renewable power alone. Let them also reap a part of the profit that is there in renewables. So I think it was a really, at least for me, an interesting session and uh, looking at the eyes of the other side also uh, for, yeah, interesting. So thank you very much for, to the public, to the organizer, to all uh, speakers. Uh, I just wanted to say a last anecdote. Uh, 11 years ago there was a conference, or 10 years ago, and it was just after the European Renewable Energy Council had launched a 20% target renewables by 2020. And there was a guy from a, a high-level manager from a German uh, utility in a conference in Brussels ha said, uh, uh, oh, let's be serious. Or I don't, he was really aggressive. Don't, st stop talking uh, silly things. Uh, you, with 20% uh, renewables, you will never get them into the, the, the system. And uh, you will never be able to run a metro system with uh, renewables. Uh, and uh, somebody asked why, and he, an he answered, well, we should have to change all the way how the system works. For him, it was a completely absurd way. We are changing it.